The following rare book was published in 1789. It is called Deathbed Dialogue, being a series of conversations between Mr. Shira and Thomas Lister, who is recorded by Robert Shira, Minister of the Gospel at Kirkaldy. To the Professors of Religion in Dundee, Scotland, my brethren, that there is a God, that the Bible is a book of God, and that there is a reality in the Christian religion or foundation truths to which the Lord by His Word, working powerfully in the hearts of some, especially at their death, enables them to give and leave an ample testimony. And seeing such confirmations are so rare, and yet so much needed in this age, I therefore cheerfully complied with your desire in writing, not only the triumphant sayings which dropped from the mouth of Mr. Thomas Lister, your late pastor, but also in narrating the darkness and dejection of mind which preceded the manifestation and elevation of soul. This is the Lord's most ordinary method, not only at conversion, but also in his after dealings with his people through their life and sometimes signally at their death. He wounds and then he heals. He smites and he binds up. The damps that are made under usually terminate in the abundant consolation and joy with which he fills them. Addison, the author of these papers, entitled The Spectator, on his deathbed sent for a young gentleman, who on coming placed himself at his deathbed and said, Sir, you have called for me. What are your demands? Addison, taking him by the hand, said, Come and behold with what peace a Christian can die. I say the same with a little variation. Come and behold with what peace a Christian did die. Yea, with what bravery, not of a Roman, but of a divine kind. Here shines brightly true bravery of spirit and true greatness of soul, which Alexander is being only a shadow of, cannot in the least be compared with. How hero-like is it in a Christian to say to a soul, Go forth, my soul, go forth. What art thou afraid of? The nearer our friend was to his death, the nearer he was to his God. O oh, come and learn also to die in faith. This treatise I have divided into three parts, the first of which consists of seven conferences, of which the first conference treats of the marks of conversion, the second of the manner of conversion and of justification, the third of sanctification, the fourth of heaven, the fifth of seeing God, and so on. Thomas Lister was born on the 14th of February, 1739. He was ordained to the Holy Ministry at Dundee the 17th of September, 1762, and died in the 18th of January, 1766, being then in the 27th year of his age and 4th year of his ministry. That the Lord may bless his sermons and sayings to your salvation is a prayer of your well-wisher, Robert Shearer. A Deathbed Dialogue Conference 1. Concerning some of the evidences of conversion. Being informed that Mr. Lister was in the darkest to the state of his soul, I waited upon him and inquired how it was with his inner man, and what he had to say concerning the Lord's goodness. His reply was, Nothing, I have nothing to say. I am a poor, stupid one. I asked him if in some period of his life he had not met with deliverance from the Lord and sound joy in his word. He answered, The stony ground hearers received the word with joy, and although he had met with deliverances, they were such as were common. I observed that it seemed to be a common deliverance, a common mercy. Jacob on his deathbed speaks of, The God which fed me all my life long, and to this day, and the angel who redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Genesis 48.15 and it is a common relation, a common deliverance, David pleads. Thou art he that took me out of the womb, and it follows in verse 10, Thou art my God from my mother's belly, Psalm 22, 9. Psalm 119, 73, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding, that I may learn thy commandments. Now, though God makes fashions and takes all from their mother's womb, and in these respects is a God and deliverer of all, 
Yet none but a believer makes this use of these common relations and mercies, namely to cry for understanding that he may learn God's commandments, and that God may not be far from him, as in Psalm 22.11. Faith in a day of God's hiding himself can take an argument from a general relation till it get a more special one to plead upon. We read the parable of the sower in Matthew 13.18-24, with which we compared Hebrews 6, 1 to 11. Here we observe four things, that there are only four sorts of hearers in the visible church, that the attainments of the stony ground hearers are greater than the attainments of the wayside hearers, and that the attainments of the thorny ground hearers are greater than the attainments of the stony ground. Four, number three, it is the attainments of the thorny ground hearers Paul describes in Hebrews 6, 4-5. Once enlightened, tasting of the heavenly gift, made partakers of the Holy Ghost, tasting of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, that these are the attainments of the thorny ground hearers is evident from verse 7 and 8, that earth which drinks in the rain that comes oft upon it, but bears thorns and briars is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Number four. That is, the attainments of the three first sort of hearers differ gradually, the one from the other, the second rising above the first, and the third above the second. So the work on the good ground hearers differs not only gradually, but specifically in the very nature of it from the work on the stony and thorny ground hearers. Paul says to the Hebrew believers who are good ground hearers, verse 9, We are persuaded better things of you. Than what? Than that illumination? tasting of the heavenly gift, partaking of the Holy Ghost, tasting the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Men may have these and yet go to hell and be damned. But the things we are persuaded of you accompany salvation. And he instances in one of these better things, namely their work and labor of love to the saints. Verse 10. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed towards his name, and that you have ministered towards the saints and do minister. Here is love to the saints, not only in word, but also in deed. Now, I pose your conscience with this, and charge it to tell the truth before God, who is omniscient. Do you love the saints? He answered, If my heart did not deceive me, I love the saints. Then I said, that is a thing better than receiving the word with joy, than being enlightened, than tasting the heavenly gift, and so on. It is a thing which accompanies salvation. God will not damn the man that loves the saints. We proceeded next to observe that the self-emptiness I perceived about him was another evidence of the grace of God in him, which is always accompanied with self-abasement. Surely, says Agur, I am more brutish than any man, and of not the understanding of a man, I neither learn wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy, Proverbs 30, verses 2 and 3. He answered, His self-emptiness was not of the right kind, upon which I quoted, Luke 18, 9 to 19. Jesus spake this parable to certain who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The publican standing afar off would not so much as lift up his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Here the publican owns that he is not righteous, but unrighteous, a sinner, and so betakes himself for salvation to the mercy of God, as venting through the blood of Christ. Now tell me, what think you of this prayer? I ask if you can feelingly put it up. He answered it suited his case so exactly as if the spirit had composed it to him alone. Then I said the publican went down to his house justified rather than the other. So we translate it. But Camaro reads it. He went to his house justified and not the other. The Pharisee was justified by himself and his party and condemned by God. But the publican was justified freely by the grace of God through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. We proceeded thirdly to consider Matthew 5, verse 6, Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. We observed that desires are in the soul, what hunger and thirst are in the body. To hunger and thirst after righteousness is to desire communion with Christ and his justifying righteousness, 
in conformity to him in his holiness. Philippians 3, 7 and 9. Now I ask you, are there not desires in your soul after Christ? Is not your heart crying, O living God, for thee? He said, I cannot speak of my desires. I asked him, Is it not your burden and grief that your desires after Christ are not so constant and as strong as they should be? He replied, It was his burden and grief. I then said, The grace of God is in you. A desire of grace is an evidence of grace. And as Bradford said to careless, Thy sins are undoubtedly pardoned, for God has given you a believing and penitent heart. That is to say, a heart which desires to believe and repent. For such an one is taken by him for a believing and penitent heart indeed. A sense and hatred of corruption opposite to grace is an evidence, though among the least of the reality of grace. Thus a sense and hatred of unbelief is a sign of faith. A sense and hatred of heart hardness is a sign of heart softness, and so on. Here he opened his mind more fully and told me that the Lord did begin a work in a soul about nine or ten years of age, that then his conscience was struck with the arrows of conviction for the sins of his former years, which made him tremble, and the remembrance of them still galled him. Indeed, he said, these convictions were a mean and the Lord's hand of keeping me from youthful follies at the college. But when he heard Christians talk of words coming with power for their relief, it did always sink his spirits as he had always so little to say that way. I answered, You know that self-examination is an ordinance appointed by God for bringing persons to clearness as to the quality of the work on them, and from what had passed he might perceive the work of God on his heart to be saving, and so a spring of comfort so far as it evidence union to Christ, in whom all the seed of Israel shall be justified. But in regard... The comfort arising from Marx was very variable and fluctuating. It was both his duty and interest to have his eye fixed on an absolute promise, such as that, I am the Lord thy God, Exodus 20, verse 2, or that I, even I, am he that blots out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Isaiah 43:25 that the blood of Jesus shed for the remission of sins has brought nigh in these, or the like words, was a never-failing but an ever-flowing source of consolation. All true Christians, as a godly divine expresses it, when they come to die and to knock at heaven's gate for entrance into their master's joy, do mind far otherwise the blood that bought the inheritance than anything wrought in them to make them meet for it, or than any pains they have been at in walking or running their race towards it. The greatest part of the believer's inherent righteousness in this world lies in his faith going out of himself to Christ for all. Conference 2 Of the Manner of Conversion and Justification We read and interpreted a part of Job 33 from verse 19 to the 23rd, in which passage we have man's deplorable case. He loses his stomach, verse 20. His life abhors bread and his soul delicate meat. His body being under a consumption becomes a skeleton, nothing but skin and bones. His flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen, and the bones that were not seen stick out. Verse 21. His soul in his own apprehension approaches to the bottomless pit to be carried there by devils, these destroyers of mankind. His soul draws near to the grave and his life to the destroyers. Verse 22. Thus a man is troubled in body and in mind, to whom God has yet thoughts of love. From verse 23rd to the 26th, we have man's sovereign cure. We observed how it is performed. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand to show in a man his uprightness, verse 23. Christ is his messenger, Malachi 3, 1, and an interpreter, Hebrews 1, 1. This phrase, one among a thousand, is similar to that in Song 5, 10. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chief among ten thousand. And the phrase here is to show not to the man, but unto man, which imports that the interpreter who shows is more than a man, even a God-man. This interpreter is said to be with him, namely by his spirit. 
John 16, verse 18, and his business now is to show unto man his uprightness, that is, his righteousness for justification, called the righteousness of God, verse 26, and in Matthew 6, verse 33. This righteousness flows from and partly consists in a ransom being paid and an atonement being made by suffering for sin. This righteousness he shows in Psalm 11, 9, Isaiah 46, 12, and shows it also in the gospel in Romans 1, 16 and 17. He shows his righteousness both objectively and subjectively. The subjective revelation of it takes place when the objective revelation is accompanied by the Holy Ghost with such power and evidence as to beget faith. Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17. The grace and act of faith come by hearing about the object of faith, which act lays hold on the offered righteousness. And this righteousness being on the believer, he is gracious to him, i.e. God the Father makes him accepted in the beloved Ephesians 1, 6. Moreover, he says, deliver him from going down into the pit, for I have found a ransom. He says, that is, the Father says to the Spirit, deliver him from going down to the pit, and so on. That is, intimate and make known his deliverance from damnation because I found one who gave his life a ransom for mankind and sinners. And what follows this intimation? With respect to the body, it is said in verse 25, his flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. That is, if the body be not recovered from its consumption, yet all his bones shall say, O Lord, who is like unto thee? In relation to the soul, verse 26, he shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him, and he shall see his face with joy. That is, having his heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, he shall freely converse with God, who is no longer a terror to him, but is exceeding joy. We enlarge our thoughts about man to whom Christ shows his righteousness, for encouraging our faith and hope. We inquired, what is man before Christ? Shows to him his righteousness. We found from Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, that the men at Ephesus before Christ showed to them his righteousness were dead in sins, walking like ghosts according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, fulfilling the desires or lusts of the flesh and of the mind, children of wrath. We learn from Colossians 1.21 what the men of Colossae were before regenerating grace reached their hearts, namely, enemies in their minds by wicked works. And what these works were, we have an account of in chapter 3, 5 to 7. We learn from 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11 what the men of Corinth were before conversion. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor thieves, nor covetous, and so on shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, i.e. some of you were fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of yourselves with mankind, and so on. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified, and so on. What Paul and Titus were before justifying grace reached them, we find by reading Titus 3.3. 3. We ourselves were also sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Works of righteousness cannot be done by men living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Nevertheless, grace saved them, verses 4 and 5. The first sin of the first Adam was one of the greatest sins that ever was, for his after sins and the sins of other men were and are the sins of sinners. But the first sin of the first man was a sin of an holy man, and yet forgiven, for God clothes them with the skins of these beasts, whose bodies he offered in sacrifice, which are types of Christ given himself as sacrifice for sin. And some think that Adam called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living, in the same sense in which Abraham was called the father of the faithful. The sin of killing the second Adam was another of the greatest sins, and yet forgiven, Acts 2, 37 and 47. All manner of sin and blasphemy is forgiven unto men. Through this man is preached unto us the forgiveness of sins, of all manner of sin and blasphemy. Oh, what encouragement is here to our faith and hope? These are glad tidings. 
But he said, I have scruples in my mind of the same import with those you told me of, as being in the mind of Mr. N, touching the election, and added, If I said anything for solution, perhaps it might increase them. So here we observe that Jesus was at the council table where nothing passed to the prejudice of any poor sinner that would venture the salvation of a soul upon his precious blood. It was concerted there that the object and warrant of faith should be no hidden counsel but an openly revealed truth, namely, that Christ shed his blood for the remission of sin, and that whosoever will might come to him, and him that cometh he will in no wise cast out. In all those places of scripture where election is mentioned is brought in for the encouragement of believers, that they may have the comfort of their election, and for the encouragement of ministers, that they might know that their labor is not in vain, or else is a check and blow to those who are final rejectors and despisers of Christ. But it is nowhere brought in to discourage any sinner from closing with the Savior, all that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out, and so on. John six thirty seven. Number 3. We observe that in Titus 1, 1, faith is called the faith of God's elect, because none but God's elect receive it, and because election may be known by it in being a fruit of electing love. It is an excellent saying of Bradford, no man should go to the university of predestination till he be well trained up in the school of faith and repentance. If we be sure we have faith, we may be sure we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. If Christ has made such an hole in your heart that none but himself can fill, if we see no hand in earth nor heaven to entrust our soul in but Christ's, if he be precious to us, without doubt we have faith according to 1 Peter 2.7. And so we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Conference number three concerning sanctification. Understanding that Mr. Lister had been complaining of the hypocrisy of his heart, in words to this purpose that he had sometimes spoken good of that which he hated and spoken ill of that which he loved, I therefore read and glossed a part of Romans 7. Paul speaks of his own state under conviction, as of a thing passed from verse seventh to fourteenth. I was so and so, and of his own state after conversion he speaks of it as a thing present from verse fourteenth to the close. In verse fourteen he says, I am carnal. He found himself such. In the twenty first verse, I find then a law that when I would do good evil is present with me. He experienced the power and efficacy of the corrupt heart. That man is under the dominion of sin who has no experience of the power of it in himself. He says, I am sold under sin, verse 14. He did not indeed sell himself to commit sin as Ahab, First Kings 21.21. 21. Howbeit he was sold as a captive, his sins captive, verse 23, and so against his will. For he says, that which I do I allow not, verse 15. That is, that evil which I do I approve not of. For what I would, i.e. what good I would, I do not. As if he had said, I am divided greatly. There is in me an I and an I, two parties in combat. And because he was deeply affected with this, he repeats it in verse 19. His renewed part consents to the law of God and descends from the law of sin. Yea, protests against the deeds of the unrenewed part, verses 16 and 17. And, as if one protest was not enough, he protests again in verse 20. He owns there is a principle in his will inclining him to that which is spiritually good, and a contrary principle inclining him to evil, with an aversion to that which is good, and that his actual willingness, and that good in particular, is opposed by that contrary principle, the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, verses 18 and 21. And so he complains in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? These remains of sin and the workings of them in believers clearly demonstrate that justification is not, nor can be, by works, as the best of their good works hath a mixture of evil in them. Next we proceeded to consider what kept up Paul's heart under this conflict. He says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, 
What did he thank God for? He thanked God for justifying him without works, chapter 5, 1. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And being justified by faith, there is therefore now no condemnation to him, nor to any other believer in chapter 8, verse 1. He who is justified cannot be a condemned man. But does not the principle of corruption and the working of it condemn you, Paul? Oh no, he says. They humble me and make me say, of all sinners I am the chief. Yet they do not condemn and never will damn me. Although in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing, yet in Christ I am complete. God looks on me as not guilty, and so there is no condemnation to me. Christ is our last Adam. Verse 15, And so in him we stand complete in all the will of God, and so thanks, ten thousand thanks to God for Jesus Christ. Conference number four of Heaven and the Happiness of It. We discourse at this time about heaven and the happiness of it. We observe that the happiness of heaven was expressed several ways. The Jews expressed the happiness of heaven three ways. Number one, by being under the altar in white robes. Number two, by being in the Garden of Eden or paradise. And number three, by being in Abraham's bosom. Each of these notions is scriptural. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The Jews at feasts leaned upon the bosom of one another. And so to be in Abraham's bosom is to be fed with him on hidden manna, the tree of life, and at the living fountains of waters. Further, the happiness of heaven is expressed in several ways in Matthew 5 from verses 3 to 12. And it is expressed seven ways in the seven epistles to the churches of Asia. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. Moreover, it is called glory in 2 Corinthians 4.17. And this glory the apostle explains by the emblem of a house, a building not made with hands, by the metaphorical expression of clothing upon, or an upper garment, verses 2 and 3, and by the proper expression of life, verse 4. That mortality might be swallowed up of life, that is, that sin may be swallowed up of holiness, shame swallowed up of honor, sorrow swallowed up of joy, all misery swallowed up of blessedness, as darkness is swallowed up of light, or as a dross cleaving to a lump of metal is swallowed up of the fire, the fire of a vehement hot furnace, such as that into which bells are cast, quickly consumes the dross, and instantly assimilates the metal to itself so that it appears all fire, even so this life is so rich, so overflowingly rich and abundant is that, by the overcoming vehemence of it, it does, in the twinkling of an eye, consume all that evil which cleave to the soul, while in the body, and to the body while in the grave, and the soul of the believer at death appears to be all blessedness, and their whole person, at the resurrection of the body, appears to be all over happiness. You will afterwards receive me to glory. So it runs in the original. It is a saying of Dr. John Owen that no man ought to look for anything in heaven but what one way or other he has experience of on earth. This saying is just, for grace is glory begun, Second Corinthians 4.17. And so believers are said to have the first fruits of the Spirit, Romans 8.23. And most remarkable to this purpose is 1 Corinthians 2.9 and 10. I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. It is a fault in some writers and preachers to make the stop here. But let us read on, and it follows, but God has revealed them to us by his Spirit, namely those things which I has not seen nor ear heard. We see God here by faith. There is a fiducial vision of God here as well as a beatific vision of God hereafter. There is a conformity to Christ begun here, which is perfected hereafter. By faith we perceive the love of God here. The Spirit sheds abroad the love of God in our hearts, which warms our hearts to God. And the warmer our hearts are to God, the more we know of heaven's happiness. When talking thus, a soliloquy of the martyr Mackay came to mind, who after he was condemned to death said, I know the manner, time, and place of my death. How shall I conceive of the invisible state? Having considered and compared together some of the metaphorical expressions by which heaven is described, he adds, 
I cannot take up heaven by similitudes, but I'll conceive of it as a state in which men, perceiving clearly the love of God, become all love to God. This view of heaven is very agreeable to the Holy Scriptures. Conference number five of Seeing God. At another time we came to visit Mr. Lister, and having found others in company with him discoursing concerning God, we quoted John one eighteen. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And we observed that some grave writers allege it is not the essence of God which John says, no man has seen at any time. For it is a question of the angels who stand in his presence, and spirits of just men may perfect have, or ever will have, an immediate intuitive sight of God's essence. But the meaning seems to be no man has seen that in God which Christ as mediator has declared about him. For example, no man by his natural understanding has at any time taken up God as a God that justifies the ungodly. But Christ has declared him to be such. Again, no man at any time has perceived God to be a God that made Christ sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, and in this way justifies the ungodly. But Christ has declared him to be such. Further, no man has at any time by his intellective faculty conceived God to be love, but Christ has declared him to be so. Moreover, no man at any time has taken up God as a God that made Christ a curse for us, that we might be redeemed from the curse of the law, and that the blessing of Abraham, i.e. the blessing of justification by faith, might come upon us, and in this way manifest himself to be of infinite love. But Christ has declared him to be such. It is said of Moses that he endured his seeing him who is invisible. And what glass did he see, God? We answered in the glass of that revelation which God made of himself. Now, though we should not believe yet, he abides faithful and cannot deny himself to be the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiven iniquity, transgression, and sin. We have the same glass. Lord, grant us as good of eyes. The remains of unbelief are like a film on the eye of faith and Mars clear seeing. While discoursing thus, he by his eager looks and elevated hands testified his approbation. Afterwards, he took a little food, and being inclined to rest, we withdrew. On our return, he feelingly uttered these words, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. And then signified that last night, being his last Sabbath night on earth, he was constrained to cry out at the view he had got of Christ as a propitiation for his sin. By the grace of God I look and will look to the blood of Christ as a propitiation for my sin, and I am sure I will never perish. He added, among all the redeemed company I shall be the greatest monument of free grace. I could not but observe to him that God, who is a revealer of secrets, had last night made that manner of sweet meditation to him, which he had directed me to speak of in the forenoon. And I may and must say with Jeremiah, great is his faithfulness, his promises, surely shall one say in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. God has made out that promise at last to you, blessed be his name. Conference number six of his gracious liberation. On Wednesday morning about eight, I was called for and told that it had been an extraordinary night of God with Mr. Lister and that he was desirous of seeing me. I went to him, and though he was seized with a fit of coughing as I entered the room, yet he instantly stretched out his right hand and taking hold of mine said, Come, O oh, come, and rejoice with me. I replied, I understand the salvation of God has come to this house in a very uncommon manner this night, and that I came on purpose to rejoice with him and, and help him to praise a precious Redeemer. After a short pause, he said, I have been a poor man all my life, held at, under, and bound by the cords of atheism and unbelief. Howbeit this night the Lord came and not only loose my bonds, but sent a multitude of the heavenly hosts to carry my soul home to heaven. To which I replied, All praise to God and the Lamb. We observe that upon Christ's head are many crowns. 
His Father has put a crown upon him, crowned him with glory and honor. His mother, the church, puts a crown on him, crowns him with a crown of the honor of her salvation. And every believer puts on Christ's head the crown of the glory of their particular salvation. The soul immediately at its departure receives a crown of glory, which is a crown of grace. And as if ashamed to wear a crown in Christ's presence, they all cast their crowns at his feet, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. And crying with a loud voice, Salvation to our God, who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. I desired him to go on and preach Christ to us. Lady Elchi, on her deathbed, having asked a godly Thomas Halliburton if there was anything incumbent on her before she died, he answered, two things are incumbent on dying persons. One, to make sure their interest in Christ, and number two, to leave a testimony to others of the Lord's goodness to them. And madam, he said, you have done both, and so have no more to do but die. He said, his name is Jesus. Heaven, I say, heaven is in that name. Worthy, worthy is a lamb. He desired to rise once more and said, Then shall I go to bed for good and all. His clothes being put on, he said to me, Pray, or rather praise. I answered, If you incline, we may do both. He directed me to sing. Psalm 116, 15 to 19. Dear in God's sight is his saint's death, thy servant Lord am I. Thy servant sure, thy handmaid's son, my bands thou didst untie. Thank offerings I to thee will give, and on God's name will call. I'll pay my vows now to the Lord before his people all. After prayer, an intimate being present said to him, I understand you have got much from above. Yes, he said, I was obliged to cry out. What a God is this, who superabounds in the freedom of his grace and riches of his mercy. Is this a manner of man, O Lord God? He said, He found not his spirits up as formerly. I told him the weakness of his body and the strength of the manifestation had contributed to exhaust his animal spirits. For the nature of the manifestation, I apprehended, was such, that if it continued a little longer, his soul had thereby been sucked out of his body, and it left lying on a breathless lump. The Lord says to Moses, Thou canst not see my face and live. He cannot take up grace in God as they in heaven do, and yet remain in the body. I further signify to him that if it please the Lord to continue him in the body for some time, he behoved to lay his account with attacks from the powers of darkness, such as Paul met with. He said the devil was not absent in the very time of it. I told him, that was an evidence of the manifestation being genuine and saving, for when the strong man keeps the house, the goods are in peace. Conference 7 Concerning His Full Assurance Thursday morning an express came for me and told me if I did not haste, I would not see Mr. Lister in life. I hasted and found him revived. Sometimes he roved, but seemed to have a deep concern upon his heart about his congregation. I told him he would see severals of them in heaven, and name two. And one of his parishioners being present said he hoped he would see some seals of his ministry in heaven. Paul says to the believers in Thessalonica, What is our joy and crown of rejoicing? Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Yet in beholding Christ's own glory in heaven lies the main part of our happiness there. Christ will be glad to see you in heaven and you will be glad to see Christ there. For as one says, he thinks himself only as half glorified till all his people be glorified with him. He desired me to praise by singing Psalm 116 from the beginning to the ninth verse. I love the Lord because my voice and prayers did he did hear. I, while I live, will call on him who bowed to me his ear. Of death the cords and sorrows did about me compass round. The pains of hell took hold of me. I grief and trouble found. Upon the name of God the Lord, then did I call and say, Deliver thou my soul, O Lord, I do thee humbly pray. God merciful and righteous is, yea, gracious is our Lord. God saves the meek, I was brought low, he did me help afford. O thou my soul, do thou return unto thy quiet rest. For largely, lo, the Lord to thee his bounty has expressed. 
For my distressed soul from death delivered was by thee. Thou didst my morning eyes from tears, my feet from falling free. After prayer I told him I was going to the country to examine, and hoped the Lord would be with us both. He said he hoped so, and added, I never had so much hope in God all my life as I have now. I then, touching on his shoulder, said, Thou art a piece of Christ's mystical body. Yes, yes, he said. I have a being, a new being in God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. On Friday I asked him how he did. He answered, Not amiss. He roved much through this day, but in the midst of his rovings he still expressed a concern about his congregation, as we learn from his pronouncing that word, namely, congregation, in his addresses to the throne of grace. The last words which a near relation heard him utter were these, where I am, there shall also my servant be. Worthy, worthy, worthy. And then he fell asleep, and that only worthy one to whom with the loving Father and blessed Spirit be all glory forever and ever. Amen. A Deathbed Dialogue Being a series of conversations between Mr. Shira and Mr. Thomas Lister, the late minister of the gospel at Dundee. What's interesting about this story is that this pastor died at the young age of 27 in the same city that Robert Murray McChain died at the age of 29, Dundee, Scotland.